Thanks very much, Leo, and thanks a lot, Jerry, for the uh, incredible setup there. Um, I'm not going to be as entertaining as him, but I'll try. Uh, it's a really fun topic, and um, it's sort of neat to have these things back to back so we can try to play off each other. I'm going to have a slightly different approach, maybe, in my work on viral maps, um, but it's cool to be in the same place with someone who got a name tag from Waffle House. Um, I agree that that is a like monumental professional achievement. <laughs> I got sheets responded to a tweet of mine one time, and I thought that was pretty cool, but like you win. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about two kind of examples, uh, virality and cartography. Um, one of them is actually Jerry's example, but maybe from a different approach. And um, I'm not going to repeat, uh, I didn't actually see his slides in advance, so I'm going to try hard now on the fly to adjust. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about virality and cartography and how I'm defining that and how I've been looking at it. Uh, spend most of my time talking about some analysis I've done of the maps that seem to emerge from viral maps, which is an interesting phenomena, and then uh, end with some thoughts about research opportunities that are complementary to the ones that Jerry just shared. Uh, so to begin with, a uh, little bit of background on virality. Um, at a most fundamental level, this is some kind of media that achieves rapid popularity via social sharing. This is the most like consensus definition I've been able to find of this kind of thing. And I think a really interesting thing for us as cartographers to try to wrestle with is how you could measure that. Uh, there's way less consensus about this than I was expecting to find. I was expecting to look in the computer science literature, and information science literature, social science literature, and find somebody who said, this is how you measure if something's viral or not. That really doesn't exist. Um, there is a concept of structural virality, which seems to have some traction behind it, and goal et al. Um, I'll give you the slide link later for these slides if you want it. Um, I've written an interesting paper about structural virality and online diffusion, which very, very simply says that raw popularity is not the most important thing. It's more about how many kind of times something is shared by different people. Basically, small actors have a bigger role in virality. So that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, I've got two examples I'm going to walk through today that are, are very different in sort of their seriousness. Um, so Jerry talked about phatic communication. It's something I talk about in the paper I've written for Cages. And um, the first example I have is not really about phatic communication, I would argue. Um, it's about the election, and it's about um, basically this moment in the 2016 election where uh, the United States was uh, really reeling from um, the knowledge that the presidential candidate at the time, um, now the orange person in charge, uh, was involved in this Access Hollywood scandal. And so Nate Silver, who has a huge audience, uh, posts this map, uh, to Jerry's point about sort of space and time being really critical to virality, posts this map about here's what the electoral map looks like if only women vote. Uh, and it gets a huge amount of traction. Um, it gets lots and lots of uh, audience metrics. And I've kind of broken things down here into different cartographic elements as well as some message and social engagement um, metrics that I think are relevant if we're trying to study what viral maps do. Um, the context here matters a lot. Like Jerry was saying, if it didn't happen at this moment, it wouldn't, I, I, I think it's safe to say it wouldn't probably catch on in the same way it did. And it has tons and tons of engagement, you know, thousands and thousands of people of whom all of those have thousands and thousands of people potentially that are their audiences. So uh, millions of followers in Nate's case. So Nate could potentially every minute make something that you could argue is a viral piece of media. The second example I'm talking about in a little bit is a little bit less like that, uh, where we're talking about a different kind of audience. But one thing I've noticed uh, right away in looking at this map got me interested in is that there were a lot more maps that were generated from it. Jerry's is a perfect example from the eclipse as well. Um, this is a sample here. It's a little matrix here of 500 what if only X voted maps that I collected from Twitter. I'm going to come back to this uh, as a data set that I explore later on in this talk. But just for now, just consider that there were many, many more than these. Uh, I just collected the first 500 that I could find. Um, what if goats voted? What if you know, people who were born in Oregon voted? I mean, it's just all kinds of different things. Some of them serious, some of them not. Um, I also noticed that, uh, much like in Jerry's case, there was a map here that itself became a viral map that was a response to the original. Um, so this is like a map collage here of what if other different types of people, if only they voted. And um, there is an author who's written a little blog post. I managed to track down the person who did this um, and wrote a little bit about how they constructed it. But these are very hard to pin down if you're not <laughs> Jerry and you're coming here and telling us how you made it and why you did it. Um, these artifacts are, are maybe can spawn from viral, basically viral maps can make other viral maps happen. That's the point. Um, so I'm going to come back to this one later as well and uh, analyze what these things mean and how they work. You just heard a lot about the Eclipse example, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, except to point out that structural virality, I think, plays a role here. 
So Josh Stevens is here, uh, has a big audience on Twitter, but he's not Nate Silver yet. Um, so he doesn't have millions of followers. So this is a more interesting thing in some ways for me because it be picked up, you know, 5,000 likes or so, I think, at this stage, thousands of retweets. It got a large audience. It became a viral thing, I think, inarguably. And if you were to look at its structural content, I think you could measure that uh, more directly. But an interesting thing to me is how many cartographers responded with new map designs to this. So in contrast to the election map example where I think people were mostly repurposing other things, um, lots of cartographers, including uh, Jerry and other people in this room, um, made their own new maps um, in response to this. All of them, I would argue, having a sort of entertainment, fatic quality, uh, hallway chatter, like this is fun uh, kind of thing, right? It wasn't, it's not to like, you know, I'm gonna change the world with this thing. I just wanna be like, let's be happy about the craziness of an eclipse and this kind of silly data set and like what can we do with overlay? Um, so it's fun. So these are uh, 35 or so maps or things with maps in them, including the UN logo, um, which I collected uh, that I, I was able to find that it seemed to be have, have like responded uh, to the original that Josh posted. Um, and as you heard uh, earlier, these are newsworthy. So Josh's map uh, was very newsworthy. Uh, he was saying earlier at the beginning of the session that Jack Lynx, uh, who's uh, famous for like having like chilling with Sasquatch, for the jerky stuff, uh, they sent him a big care package, which I think is also an achievement in addition to getting Waffle House swag, getting beef jerky swag is pretty cool. Um, I'm open to receiving swag from companies like that. Um, um, so this is, this is newsworthy stuff. Josh had a lot of uh, stuff, and you just saw a great talk about the Waffle House uh, map itself becoming, this is a different article than the one you, you showed three other ones. I actually happened to find another one. Um, so uh, this is newsworthy stuff. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Like these are cartography, uh, you know, aspects of cartography that get a lot of popular traction. So if we care about the impact of mapping, we ought to understand more about how they work. So that's where I'm coming into this. I didn't make a viral map, unfortunately, uh, but I'm trying to look at them and make sense out of them. And so I've been doing some stuff with machine learning, which I, I don't know a whole lot about yet, but um, I'm, I'm dabbling. So to begin with, I took the uh, Nate Silver election example here, and I'm searching for the map if only, uh, basically if only voted map. And I'm finding, you find, you can do it right now, and you'll find hundreds and hundreds of examples. Uh, including this one, uh, it may be a little bit hard to see in the back, but there's like a piece of steak, United Steak of America. Um, I collected that, like I had to cut that out of my sampling because it was so common. I have no idea why. I don't know how many, I don't know if that's like an inverse Huffman or how that gets measured. <laughs> But I, but I feel like a map made out of meat, is there should be maybe a whole thing on that because it seems to be used a lot on the internet. So I collected lots of maps. Um, I used uh, Twitter API and the Tweepy library in Python uh, for, for um, basically selecting the images with this search string and trying to get down to the image, exact image URLs, which is really hard to do. Um, because I can't program, so I struggled through this. Um, I eventually got it. I downloaded um, uh, the original images. In this case, there were 500 images that I selected um, for the election example. I'm feeding those to Google Cloud Vision, which is one of many different uh, sort of machine learning platforms for automating image analysis. It's a black box algorithm. I don't know how it works. Um, I, you can be mad about that, and that's cool. I've I wish I knew more about how to do that all by myself, but I don't. So I used a cloud service. There's Amazon has another, another one that's competitor. There's lots of potential to do more research on this. Please do that research. Um, this is one way of doing it. So I did this, gave this stuff to Google Cloud Vision. I took the JSON results and uh, visualized those in Tableau, and that's what you're going to see some about in just a minute. So here again, this is my sample of 500 essentially maps that are inspired by or derived from the originals. So these are. From a viral map, kind of what do we get from that? What comes out the other side? Uh, what's the infection look like? <laughs> this is, mine talks a little bit darker than Jerry's. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is what that looks like. I used a tool called ImageJ here to um, order the uh, images here by hue and um, contrast, in case that's something interesting to you, if you have lots of maps and you want to make them look cool. So here's what happens. Um, if we give Google Cloud Vision this set of images, uh, it gives you several different types of information. One of them is image labels, and this is sort of best described as kind of the core topics or uh, structural characteristics of what it, the algorithm, sees. Um, what's cool about this is that it sees map as the most important topic or the most important characteristic of these things. So what's kind of neat is that uh, although it's certainly not perfect, it's correctly, in my view, detecting maps. Uh, which has some affordance for future research, I think. It also comes up with line drawings and areas and fonts. It says ecoregions. 
Uh, fictional characters, some of these were sort of fantasy looking maps that I found. Um, meat does not come up in here, although organism does. And so I suspect that that has something to do with the shape of the United States. So it's kind of interesting that this uh, machine learning algorithm doesn't recognize a boundary as a thing. Um, because not, none of this is geographic here. On the other hand, um, there's one of the other things it gives you is web entities. And this is more like the web keyword results that are relevant to that image type. And this is where you get context. So this is really interesting. This is where we start getting election stuff, United States, map again is there, electoral college, um, I made sure Donald Trump was in orange, uh, <laughs> politics, uh, Republican Party, Hillary Clinton. So we're getting a lot more of what, actu what this map was about uh, from this set of information. So these things, two things together are quite complementary, I think. Um, in the Waffle House example, I've done the same thing. So this is a much smaller set of maps. This is only a 30 or so. Uh, but I've also looked at the image labels and the entities for this just to try to compare like two very different kind of case studies. So we're finding very similar image labels for this. So um, the topicality here is mostly about mapping, diagrams. There's an angular dimension, I think, because of the swipe across the map of the um, eclipse swath, which is kind of interesting here. Uh, the words about design and things like graphic design seem to come into this, so I think that this uh, Google Cloud Vision thinks we're better at design than <laughs> random people repurposing stuff, <laughs> which is probably good. Um, again, with the web entities, this is where we actually get some of the context. So solar eclipse comes into play, United States, uh, data about the world, information. Bigfoot is here, <laughs> which is hysterical to me. <laughs> probably the only time this algorithm has ever generated Bigfoot as a result. Um, Bigfoot and NASA, so congratulations, Josh. Uh, those two things happened in this thing here. Um, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm really fascinated by another element of these uh, image matching uh, image analysis algorithms, and that is looking at the match results. So something Google Cloud Vision can do and some of these other platforms can do as well is look for URLs uh, out there on the web that have partial or complete matches to a given image. So this is how we can start to understand the provenance of some of this stuff. Like where did that map come from? In the Eclipse case, we know because of, we can read that these were generated organically by individual designers in almost every case. In the election map example, it is way more sort of random audience of public folks who seem to be repurposing things. And that begs the question of like where are they repurposing them from? And um, one thing I started to look at here was this particular collage here, like where did that come from? What are its potential sort of, what's this diaspora essentially on the internet? I found 48 exact matching URLs and 50 that partially match. This is the image itself matching. So this is a, a way to start looking at the web context for this stuff. Where does it live? Where does it come from? And um, one really interesting example here um, is that these are some of the partial matches. Uh, one of the partial matching URLs is, does anybody have a source for this image? <laughs> Which was a question I had. Um, and then another th set of three I found are in different languages. So these have been translated by who I don't know who um, and switched into a different language and used in a context in a web page or a Reddit post or another tweet. And so there's all of this discussion that's happening with these derived works uh, that I think is worthy of a lot more exploration here. Uh, another thing that I will add here is that the context for these URLs sometimes you could see by the name of the blog that it was used on shows some of the political differences in how these particular maps were reused. Uh, so this example and some of the other ones about what if only uh, college edu uh, educated people vote and things like that, what if only white people vote, were reused uh, both by liberal interests and far right interests, sometimes the same image. Uh, to make a radically different point. Uh, some of it just openly racist, a lot of it completely false. So just changing the title on the image and saying this is where, if, where what if only taxpayers vote, uh, which is complete garbage. None of these maps showed that information. And that's data that all of us in this room be like, where'd you get that? You got state data on taxpayers who vote? Like, hmm, please <laughs> welcome me to your census. What is this? Yes, I am awaiting this. Sounds great. Where's that data? Um, so in the last couple seconds here, I've hinted at some of the research opportunities. Um, in the paper I've written, I've got a lot more. And there's four kind of core questions here, and I'm going to focus on one. Uh, one's about sort of how do we capture this stuff. <laughs> um, we can use the image uh, analysis algorithms that I used retrospectively as a, a real-time thing. That's actually what they're built for. Uh, not for viral maps, but for looking at huge numbers of images in real time and categorizing them. 
Uh, I'm interested in this one about can we intentionally create a viral map? Uh, Josh Stevens, Andy Woodruff, and quite a few other cartographers, Lisa Charlotte Ross, uh, seem to be able to do this, <laughs> but we don't really know how. <laughs> they're just sort of doing it because they're inspired and they're artists, I guess, right? Um, I'm interested as well as how these things are perceived by users and, of course, what social roles do they play. Uh, now, Jerry did a great job talking about phatic communication, which I feel like has got to be a part of this, right? It's, it's, it's the internet version of hallway chatter. It's like, did you see that thing about Waffle House? <laughs> It's crazy, right? Um, <laughs> I should send them some stuff. So I'm going to focus on the, on, the, on the darker timeline here, which is uh, can we intentionally create a viral map? And I'm going to bring you down about 10 notches. Um, first of all, my point would be that bots can create new media. This is like old. This has already happened. Uh, there's a terrifying company called NarrativeScience.com, which will like write news articles using AI. Um, I don't know if that's already in use. I assume it probably has a business case somewhere, and it probably is used. Um, some of you may have seen the so-called deep fake videos of things. There's one of, of President Obama um, that's actually Jordan Peele talking. And it's, uh, if you think about the crazy crap your family believes on Facebook, these things are way more convincing than that. Um, so let's just setting the scene a little bit. Uh, bot generated maps already exist. Martin O'Leary uh, does a whole, basically this is like his job, I think. Um, it's awesome, I would love to meet him. If he, I don't know if he ever comes to NASIS, but he should. Uh, we should get him to do a keynote, maybe. Because um, he has this sort of cottage industry of building uh, bots that create these beautiful uh, artistic uh, maps. And then bots and trolls already are employed to spread disinformation. <clears throat> so I'm building up to this point of, I believe it's possibly already happening. Oh, I'm out of time. Um, possibly already happening that maps are generated, perhaps automatically, and amplified for the purpose of disinformation. If you think about using something like an election, we already understand that there are nation states that would love to disrupt these things. And I take inspiration here from Kate Starbird's work at University of Washington. Uh, it's an amazing information scientist who has studied, for example, this little uh, thing on the right here. It's just a kind of weird looking heat mappy thing. That's actually showing uh, somewhat of a visualization of um, state driven trolls and bots were kind of working in coordinates with each other, so the automated and the non-automated troll, um, to amplify hard right and hard left messages about Black Lives Matter with the purpose of creating disruption. Like the purpose is to create more conflict. That's the idea. Um, so the thing that I think is scary that I'll leave you with is that I think that you could make a fake map that does that and amplify it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> If you're interested in more about this, uh, I've got the slides uh, that I'll be providing here, as well as the paper. Um, uh, these are tiny URLs. You're welcome to grab those things, take a look. Thanks a lot. Well, we've got time for some questions, if anyone wants to ask Anthony something. So the question is, have I tried yet to make a viral map? No, I haven't tried to do that myself yet. I'm, I think I'm more interested in, on observing this uh, from the side a little bit. And I, what I'm trying to get some funding for right now is to match some of these automated image analysis techniques to streams of images to pick out the maps and detect the, I, I want to try to find these things as they're emerging and then look at their derivations more systematically. I think that would be really cool. Um, obviously, one thing that's missing in these image analysis uh, mechanisms right now is they don't understand cartographic design variables, layout and hierarchy and symbolization and things like that that we can probably all see. And I think it'd be cool to try to train that or to, to begin working in that way as a, as a way to look at thousands and thousands of maps that are shared every second, right? Um, and getting a grasp on how, those, how that design plays out and what seems to attract communities of interest versus what doesn't? Is it just random or is there something there that uh, we should latch on to? Yes, sir. So the, the question concerns like how do you account for credibility and how, what role does the, the publisher credibility or publisher in a tweet case uh, play in this whole mess? And um, that's an amazing one. I don't have evidence for this yet. Um, it's an experiment I have planned though is to take this set of 500 maps and show them to sort of a, do a between subject study of 
credibility of those things with their tweets and all the context and without them and to see if the you know there, if there's some consistency and credibility ratings regardless of the presenter and the context around it or if that is actually playing a strong role I suspect it is playing a pretty strong role but we don't have evidence for that yet right the fact that Josh has lots of followers and a blue check mark should matter um, but then Jerry didn't have that <laughs> so, so I mean it'll be it, yeah, yeah. Right. So I think taking the context away from a set of these things and showing them to people and saying, okay, what do you like? Just look at this map of a piece of steak and tell me, like, how credible is that? <laughs> like, credible for what? Um, but with its context, if it's a funny jab or something like that, or if it's by someone who has a little insightful quip about it, it could completely transform it. Like, I have no doubt that the, that the words matter, too. Okay, let's thank Anthony. I'm gonna, uh